A very good evening to our respected chief guest and speaker of the day, Shri Iqbal Singh Chahal. To all our awardees and dignitaries, presidents of all the esteemed organizations, trustees, members, friends, Mrs. Ursula Verma and family. A very warm welcome to you all to the sixth late Narayan Verma Memorial Lecture and the Narayan Verma Memorial Awards, jointly organized by three premium and prestigious organizations of Mumbai, the Public Concern for Governance Trust, the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society, and DBM India, all of whom with which our beloved Narayan Verma was closely associated, held various posts, and mentored and nurtured them with his values, ideology, and hard work. Truly said, a life that touches others goes on forever. We are here today to salute him, to remember him, and pay a tribute to his spirit of giving, his professionalism, and his commitment towards service to humanity, his relentless quest for truth and justice, his wit and wisdom, his vision and planning, and his determination to make a difference day after day. The greatness of one's life depends not on the number of years lived, but rather on the effect one leaves on the minds of one's generation. Narayan Bhai inspired us with his simplicity and humanity, and he inspired us by setting examples. Finding the right words to sum up a le legend who meant so much to us is incredibly hard. Hence, today is our humble effort to say we remember you always and cherish all the wonderful memories we have. You are missed, our dear Envy, with each passing day. Today's program will be in two parts. The first part will be a talk by our esteemed and distinguished speaker of the day, a man we salute, we respect, Sri Iqbal Singh Chehel, IAS, BMC Commissioner, the man who led Mumbai dynamically during the most disastrous times of the pandemic with the true spirit of humanity and leadership. He is speaking to us on a very relevant topic today, Mumbai's COVID pandemic management model. The second part will contribute the NB Memorial Awards. Wherever a beautiful soul has been, there is a trail of beautiful memories. We will now show you a short glimpse of precious moments with our dearest Narayan Bhai. have a message from our dearest Ursula auntie. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> this, this year would have been Narayan's 90th birthday. We are so grateful for sharing his memories with all his friends from BCAS, DBM India, and PCGT. He always felt so proud of these organizations. He loved all their members and friends whom he became so fond of and formed a personal bond with. 
I especially want to thank Fareen for her undying enthusiasm and effort to organize this meeting. The Varma, Varma family thanks you and cordially invites you all for the sixth Narayan Varma Memorial Lecture today from Ursula Narayan Varma. I now request DBM President Mr. Paramjit Singh to give the formal welcome address. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Fareen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to you all to this annual Narayan Verma Memorial Lecture and Awards in memory of our dear friend, guide, and mentor, Shri Narayan Verma. I welcome you all on behalf of the three partner organizations, BCAS, PCDT, and DBM India, who were united by Narayan Bhai and who continue to work together closely because the aim of all the three organizations is the same, that is service to society. We three organizations take turns in organizing the event, and this year it is a turn of DBM India. In reality, however, we all work as a team, and the program is a rare and shining example of collaborative working between organizations. For this, I not only thank the respective heads at BCAS, Mr. Abhay Mehta, and PCGT, Mr. Julie Ribeiro, but the entire teams at the three organizations who work as one in making this event a successful one. Before I talk about this program, I heartily welcome our keynote speaker of the day, Shri Iqbal Singh Chahel. Thank you, sir, for taking time out and accepting our request to do the honors. The pandemic still continues and you and the entire government is busy chalking out strategies to counter the third wave and other measures like opening the economy and breaking the chain. So we deeply appreciate your taking out time for us. We also warmly welcome the three awardees who are once again busy people doing relentless good work. The more the situation becomes hopeless, good people like them redouble their efforts and we are very thankful to them for honoring us by being here, by being coming here, and one of them has even joined from all the way from UK. A very warm welcome also to the members of public, our friends, well wishers, team members, Mrs. Ursula Verma, and other members of the Verma family for joining today to pay tribute to Naran Bhai, who continues to inspire us. As Farin has mentioned, he was an institution in himself, though he helped build many institutions. He was a successful chartered accountant and was secretary of the Western India Regional Council of Institute of Chartered Accountants. He was a president of BCAS and also the president of Chamber of Tax Consultants and other professional bodies. He had this ability to work seamlessly with different bodies without any conflict of interest. And it was his daring nature through which he carried everyone along and made even rival bodies work together. Apart from his professional brilliance, he was also a philanthropist and a social do-gooder. He was a trustee of many trusts yeah. like Giants International, BCAS Foundation, MR Pi Foundation, and of course, PCGT wow. and DBM India. Visible to everyone? Yeah. Your mic is on. He was not just a trustee in these yeah. organizations, but he worked hard and left a mark in each of them. He was a crusader for the Right to Information Act, and at DBM, he continuously pushed us into new areas of helping and empowering the poor and the needy. But above all, he was a great human being and a great friend. And that is what brings us together, all together every year to celebrate his legacy so that all of us continue to be inspired and to do more and more. This is also reflected in our choice for speakers and the awardees for this memorial function. They too are selfless people who are doing great humanitarian jobs. I am sure all of us who are present here today will be greatly motivated after hearing not only about the extraordinary life of Narayan Bhai, but also after listening about the exemplary work done by our keynote speaker and the three awardees. So sit tight, ladies and gentlemen, and be ready to be inspired. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paramjit, sir. Every year we together make an effort to have esteemed and erudite speakers who enlighten us with their knowledge and wisdom. This year, it is truly my honor 
and proud privilege to introduce a very distinguished and eminent personality, Sri Iqbal Singh Chehan, and to share with you a brief of his spectacular achievements. Sri Iqbal Singh Chehan is a 1989 batch IAS officer of Maharashtra Kader. He is currently the commissioner of Brihan Mumbai Municipal Corporation, our ever favorite BMC. He cracked the IAS exam in the year 1989 when he was less than 22 years of age, making him one of the youngest to clear the prestigious exam. With three decades of rich and diverse experience, he has served the government of Maharashtra and India in various capacities. In his initial career, he was the collector of Thane and Aurangabad districts. Later on, he was a joint secretary in the Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of Women and Child Development, and Ministry of Panchayati Raj. Following that, he was also the principal secretary in the Water Resources Department and the Urban Development Department of Maharashtra. In Mumbai's successful fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, a major role was played by our BMC commissioner, Sri Iqbal Singh Chahel. And for this, he is being celebrated all across India. The Maharashtra Civic Body's achievement has almost become a template for other beleaguered states and cities to follow. He is the first Indian bureaucrat to be recognized and to receive global acknowledgement for his contribution in controlling the novel coronavirus infection in India's financial capital and for working to flatten the curve in congested areas of the city, including Asia's biggest slum, Dharavi. The Supreme Court of India and the High Court of Maharashtra also lauded Mr. Chahel for his Mumbai model. The list of awards he has received is endless. He has been conferred the top COVID Crusader Award 2020 by the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce in the Indian bureaucrats category. Sri Iqbal Singh Chahel was honored with the Mumbai Ratna Award by Governor Bhagat Singh Koshiari. For his stellar achievement, Union Finance Minister, Ms. Nirmala Sita Raman awarded Mr. Chahel the Lokmat Maharashtra Maharashtran of the Year to 2021 Award. He has received the Award for Excellence in Crisis Management and India's Distinguished IAS Officer from Speak In. He has been awarded Maharashtran of the Year for Outstanding Performance by the Lokmat Trust Nagpur. He has received the prestigious Citizens of Mumbai Award for attracting international praise and bringing, bringing pride to our Mumbai. At the hands of Sri Uddhav Balasaheb Thakre, Chief Minister Maharashtra, he has received the Sakal Sanman 2021 for outstanding performance in COVID control. I could go on and on. Mr. Chahal is certainly not a person to sit on his laurels. He with his team is now busy preparing to take on the possible third wave of COVID-19. An architect of the internationally acclaimed Mumbai COVID fight model, as rightly said, an unputdownable Mr. Chahal. It is our honor, sir, to have you with us as our keynote speaker on today's most relevant topic, Mumbai's COVID pandemic management model. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. So we invite you, sir, now to uh, give your keynote speech. Honorable uh, Julius Ribeiro, sir, whom I hold in very high esteem and he's my role model. Respected Verma Madam, respected audience. At the outset, I would like to thank Ribeiro, sir, for giving this opportunity today to be present amongst you to present the Mumbai COVID pandemic management model. Once, uh, before I take you forward, I'll just spend a minute on the 8th of May, 2020, when I took over as the, the commissioner of MCGM at 7 p.m. in the evening. 
and that morning we had three dead bodies on the road one on the dadar footpath one auto rickshaw driver who was found dead in auto rickshaw and a third one a person who must have been gasping for breath and he was rushing from dharavi to sain hospital he his dead body was found on the road drive rider that was the eighth may evening and social media was full of videos showing multiple people lying on single bed people lying on floors in public hospital and public hospitals are only 3700 uh, beds for almost 16 million population of mcgm starting from the 8th may if we look back and see today today we have 100000 beds in mumbai out of which 30000 are actually specialized hospital beds we have 48000 quarantine beds we have 24000 uh, covid care center beds we have come a long way from 80 ambulances we have come to almost 1000 ambulances today all working on uber platform the day i took over i told my core team i said look let us not be demoralized you know i said the last pandemic came 100 years ago and uh, the next may come after 100 years i said i told my team of four very senior principal secretary rank additional commissioners joint commissioners deputy commissioners assistant commissioners award officers i said we are all chosen by god we have got an opportunity of lifeline to a lifetime to serve humanity nobody in the last 100 years or nobody in the next 100 years may get this opportunity again which we have got and this is the best time to serve humanity and i told them i said this is this is a is a is a going to be a long time war and i said uh, it is not something which in government we do something on a hoc basis for one or two months this is a long battle maybe two years three years even more and i said unless you have systems and autopilot unless everything works automatically it is systems who is going to fight this war not individuals because in war you they may be general leading the war but the systems also work automatically and i said unless we create the systems only then we can give an effective convincing and decisive uh, fight against this covid and and this the mumbai uh, covid uh, fight model has actually 27 sub models or 27 initiatives which comprise this mumbai uh, management model and each one of them is an autopilot and most of these models almost 20 of them out of this 27 were conceived designed and implemented successfully between 8th of may and 8th of june last year 2020 and the result was that last year when i took over the death rate of mumbai the mortality had touched almost 8% and the second wave when it came this year in 2021 the second wave started on 10th of february and ended officially on 31st of may 100 days during the period we got 3. 93 lakh cumulative covid positive cases against 3.13 lakh in the first wave and in this 3.93 lakh cases the mortality was 3484 which worked out to be 0.8% and i have always claimed that our mortality of 0.8% in the second wave has been lowest anywhere in the world for a comparable global city and especially mumbai which is the second most density in the world so how do we come from 8% to 0.8% it's a very it has been very challenging but a very satisfying journey for the last almost 15 months 16 months now when i joined 8th of may every evening around 7 pm we would get a list of about 1000 1200 1500 people who are getting covid positive and the, the the test reports which coming from the labs would be simply slapped on the patients through an sms or a email saying that you are covid positive full stop and the moment the patient would get that information on his sms or uh, email he would start panicking and he would start staring death he would start ring- calling up his friends who are influential maybe ministers ias officers ips officers industrialists doctors powerful people in the media trying to grab a bed and each one of the patients would generate maybe 10 calls and the 1500 patient will generate 
fifteen thousand calls between seven pm and nine pm, and a thirty line COVID control uh, room uh, would collapse, and immediately media would take over, and ultimately the phone calls would start coming from Delhi, from the Home Secretary, from the PMO that why Mumbai's COVID uh, sent control room is not working, and followed by ultimately Honorable CM would call me. Late in the night, that's what's going on. So it was a terrible phase of my life. It was the most difficult month of my life, starting from eighth of May onwards. So I told my team around eleventh and twelfth. I said we cannot continue like this. Something has to be done. So we decided to go for very radical, and we took great of risks. We took a lot of risks. Number one, we said let us scrap this control room, which is not able to uh, handle this uh, huge load of patients. And we went for immediately within 15 days' time. We created 24 ward war rooms in 24 wards of Mumbai. I said, "Let there will be decentralized fight. Let Mumbai will be split into 24 Mumbais, each fighting its own war, except a single dashboard, real time online dashboard of now 186 hospitals, which has 30,000 beds, including uh, almost 4,000 ICU beds now, uh, almost." 20,000 oxygen beds now. Those days we had only 3,700 beds with us, and I told uh, uh, our team that this war rooms, each war room would have its own doctors, dashboards, ambulances, telephone operators, telephone lines, and we created all this in 15 days' time. And then I, I I said when I when I took over on 8th of May, the first eyeball to eyeball contact which I had my team. I said no Zoom meeting. We have to meet physically. Come what may, we were we twenty one one twenty of us the core team. We met in in our conference hall in BMC, and I told them. I said uh, suddenly it came out of, of out of my mouth. I said we have to chase this virus. We have to be very offensive. Everybody was surprised that how do we chase this virus? How do we chase this invisible enemy? And we are, ultimately we did it. How did it? Next morning, to assure my team. Because a day before I joined, the central government team had come and they said that the BMC health workers are too scared to enter the containment zones. And those days we had three thousand containment zones, each having population four thousand. We had one point two crore people in Mumbai in containment zones, and the there were scathing remarks by the government of India team, which led to my uh, appointing as municipal commissioner based on the report. I said, I, I must take the sphere out. And I had tremendous faith on my body immunity because I am basically I I, uh, I do a lot of jogging, running, marathons, swimming, yoga. So I had a lot of faith in my body immunity. And and next morning we entered with my our core team of additional commissioners, ward officers into the COVID ICUs. We went to Dharavi. We did a four kilometer march in Mukund Nagar containment zone just to assure my team that there's nothing to worry. We can we can handle this. And then I visited 55 containment zones in Mumbai in the next couple of days, and each was was uh, in a march was part of it. I must spend at least one hour, one and a half hours, two hours in in every containment zone. It shouldn't be photo op. We would enter slum houses. We would do on the spot testing. Anybody find found COVID positive, we would use force to lift 15 of his family members and neighbors. And put them in uh, institutional quarantine. We requisitioned forty-eight thousand rooms in one eighty-seven hospitals, three-star, four-star hospital hospitals of Mumbai, and we started moving twenty-five to thirty thousand people every week from the slums of Mumbai into these hotels for ten days stay, free boarding and lodging. We said we will wash them their high-risk contacts. We will wash them if anybody develops symptoms. We they will move to hospital if they uh, on the day ten. We do the RT-PCR test. If they found negative, they come back to sanitized homes. Then we start. I got into this public toilets. I was told that each public toilet in a place like Dharavi is used by 200 people a day. Those 25 seats. So I would make it a point to enter the toilet and stand on the last seat for a couple of seconds with my team. I would say, and I said, let us start sanitizing these toilets five times in a day, which is happening today also, right from 9th of May. And I said. Every two hours, when the new batch of people come, they should get a sanitized toilet because this is the place where we have to chase the virus. This is the place we have to finish the virus. And in the first case, when 
30,000 people every week started moving into this three star four four star hotels in the first 8 10 days lot of resistance was there we deployed buses and we moved people out when, when people found that they are being treated so well in four star hotels free boarding and lodging for 10 days with word of mouth everybody started moving voluntarily so we in in just about 5 weeks we moved 1.45 lakh slum dwellers into these hotels from their uh, from their uh, place where they living as high risk contacts of of the confirmed positive cases so these 1.5 lakh people had they not been moved they would have created lakhs of new positives and millions of new positives over a period of months so this this was a direct hit on the, uh, in our policy strategy of chase the virus that we have to finish this virus rather than just waiting uh, and looking at it then we created community leaders in on the slum areas we said only a slum dweller with his family who's living in this containment zone for years together only he is eligible to become a community leader in the slum we gave him cell phones 3000 cell phones to 3000 containment zones and they were given my number and the control room numbers ward no, war rooms numbers and i said if you have to give us feedback on seven things number one whether health workers are entering the containment zones checking the people testing them or not whether uh, the public toilets are getting sanitized five times five times in a day or not th- whether general lanes and by lanes are getting sanitized or not what is the qu- quality of food packets those days we were distributing 900000 food packets because there was a nationwide lockdown from 24th march till 14th of may then there were almost 1500 stand alone shops of rmps registered medical practitioners and doctors who had put the shutters down we said okay we'll give you free pp kits one to the doctor and one to the assistant one week's quota in advance and you collect this from ward of our ward war rooms and we you open your shutters please treat for heaven's sake people from the non non covid uh, issues like diarrhea snake bite some headache some fever so we said we spent crores of rupees on giving these free pp kits the community leaders will inform us whether they are utilizing this whether they after procuring 28000 rupees of of uh, pp kits every week in advance whether they really using it and whether they opening their shops or not we m- literally made this 1500 doctors start functioning by end of may and this was great assurance to people so this is how we chase the virus and then coming back to the ward war room we created a software where now 186 hospitals public and private 42 uh, public and 144 private they are all on single real time integrated online dashboard and each ward war room has 10 dashboards so 24 into 10 to 40 dashboards uh, they reflect the same 186 hospitals each manned by a doctor and in three shifts so we required 240 into 3 720 and reserves 1000 doctors from where we will get them by 25th of may within 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 the three weeks of my joining we started a whatsapp campaign because i used to be medical agent secretary government of maharashtra in 2011 12 i knew maharashtra has 55 medical colleges government and private each having a batch of 200 who are sitting in lockdown people who are doing internship young boys and girls so i said you are getting 11000 rupees a stipend please come and join me from rural areas backward areas tribal areas of maharashtra i said we i'll give you 50000 rupees a stipend we'll put you in five star hotels jw marriott taj palace the nearest to the ward war room we're walking distance and i'll give you non covid work in air conditioned environment with within 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 this three weeks i got 1100 such young boys and girls who did a fantastic job and they managed these 240 dashboards and allotted beds to the patients after this we cre- we immediately went in election mode since i was district collector for 8 years norangabad and thane whenever i would i conducted five various elections to vidhan sabha and lok sabha we would tell the transport commissioner to give us vehicles and we would simply deploy them for thousands of vehicles in election duties so i requisitioned 800 innovas and sumos in flat 5 days from state transport commissioner we, i said covid patients don't need stretchers they just need to sit in the ambulance for half an hour and go to the hospital bed covid bed so we took them to our our bmc workshop 
in in just about 10 days time we added 800 fleet of new ambulances to the existing 80 only and then i went to the uber company i told the uber company i don't need your drivers i don't need your cars vehicles i just need your software platform and we put all these ambulances on uber platform so they would be available in 2 minutes notice on on auto calls it was an auto pilot then then after this uh we created a real time integrated uh, dashboard software and we put is officers young is officers in in our uh, public hospitals and we created war rooms in each of the hospital like kem nair sain seven hills peripheral hospitals and these young is officers were given number of duties that was my idea i said they will be doing another six, uh, half a dozen uh, duties number one they will make sure that every half an hour the dashboard is updated by them personally they created we created a war room in every hospital and 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 every discharge or every admission would be updated every half an hour because dashboard is of no use if it's not getting updated regularly so uh, after that i told that they must ensure the washrooms in these hospitals are sanitized for public again five times in a day we started numbering these covid beds each bed got numbered and each bed was brought in cct cameras and we started allotting beds at the residence of the patients with bed numbers If somebody was to be given to km hospital we had announced at the residence of the of the patient that you are going to km hospital 024 oxygen bed 25 for example so every bed was numbered each of this bed 30000 is on cct camera so this this is officers they started then then we told them to operationalize the canteens in these uh, hospitals so that patient relatives can <coughs> avail of the facilities they were told to maintain cleanliness in these hospitals at par with private hospitals these young is officers the rank of collectors they did an excellent job <coughs> in, in 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 taking care of these hospitals and uh, taking care of the dashboard now the biggest uh, challenge was <coughs> the panic we getting created in the market when every evening the 1500 uh, test reports would come and doctors had a lot of fatigue in the evening around 7 pm 8 pm 9 pm so i said i scrapped that system in fact i am very proud to say that we are the only one city in the world i repeat we are the only one city in the world where i passed an order in writing to 56 test labs that you shall not share a positive covid report with the patient directly if you do so we are going to cancel your license it was a very risky decision i said all these reports must come at midnight 2359 hours on a single line list of software to bmc headquarters we will clean the list with scores of doctors sitting here whole night then that's going on since 8th of june last year till today morning also these doctors clean the list they see which are the addresses which doesn't belong to bmc somebody from mira bhayendra or navi mumbai we transfer there somebody's rt pcr test has come who's to be discharged doesn't need a bed we take the name out and at 7 am automatic software splits this list of 1000 or 10000 5000 covid positive patients into 24 parts depending upon the address given on the covid positive report and by 8 am they appear on this 240 dashboards of uh, 24 ward war rooms supposing a thousand patients come positive on a particular day 24 wards each gets about 40 each dashboard gets about four only once a doctor starts calling up the patient at 8 o'clock in the morning maybe out of four two or three are asymptomatic who want to be home quarantined only we tell them that okay we'll call you five times in a day till you become negative in between if you get symptoms we'll come rush to your home pick you up and put you in hospital bed if somebody is positive the doctor immediately starts sending these 10 medical teams in pp kits with 10 ambulances parked there to the to the residence of the patients where after reaching we maintain tremendous amount of social equity you may be rich as a rich you may be poor as a poor you you will be given a bed as per your entitlement decided by our medical team your oxygen level is is monitored after we re- reach their home we check the temperature we check their uh, med- general condition and then it was our medical our our bmc ward war room team decides what category of bed you are entitled to whether you want you are entitled to a ventilator bed or icu bed oxygen bed normal covid bed and from the residence of the patient 
the ward warum doctor is called up on the cell phone and we try to adjust the choices we give them a lot hospital bed it is announced to the patient as the at his residence only and then the same ambulance waits and picks up the patient and drops him in the hospital bed once is dropped in one of the 81 86 hospitals the patient get disposed of so this system of ch of chasing the patient strategy where we chase the patient's covid positive report right from that point to putting him in the hospital bed we don't allow any patient to roam around in the market looking for beds this was unique and till today i don't have any city in india or anywhere in the world where the positive reports do not flow from the labs testing labs to the patients directly there was tremendous amount of risk involved just imagine till today we have 7.41 lakh cumulative covid positive cases in mumbai first and second wave put together and a few reports have gone missing <clears throat> and the patient had died because without report he couldn't have got treated we couldn't have got a bed in any hospital because he had no report his relatives would have sued us that because mr chels orders the patient died because he couldn't be treated because he has banned these reports to be shared from the labs to the patients but we work with razor sharp accuracy until today there's not a single case where report has gone missing i said in software i am a btech electronic engineer i said in the software you cannot have a report going missing in the system and actually we have been put proof correct in the last 15 months so this this particular system where we ensured that only we get all the positive reports patient wouldn't get get, get it directly it started uh, helping us because first number it didn't create panic in the market second we started lotting beds to the patient at the residence third the patient need not worry for the bed he need not call anybody before he could call anybody he would reach his house with a bed and and the best was that it was in own advantage because once a patient is told by the lab like other cities that you are covid positive the poor patient starts roaming around in his private car or taxi from one hospital to another hospital and by the time he gets a bed in the evening he would have infected a dozen other people here we make the patient captive and we don't allow him to spread the virus in the public domain so it worked in our our benefit only it was very risky decision but very useful for us so then we created number of other other uh, models we you when i joined i found that almost 125 people in mumbai had died not because of covid but these people had no kidneys they were in permanent dialysis and when they would become covid positive suddenly they will be put in some hospital bed somewhere and after reaching there once he is isolated he would he would be told there is no dialysis facility here and a dialysis uh, facility if not done twice or thrice a week the patient patient cannot survive without kidneys mumbai has 10000 such eminent citizens who doesn't have kidneys and they are on permanent dialysis i got a got a, a platform made from iit mumbai with the help of apex kidney foundation in 3 days may 20 to may 23 last year and we created one project victory where a portal was created if any patient who uh, is on dialysis he be gets covid positive before that we we trained the technician in 3 days and we moved them to uh, dialysis machines in 103 hospitals and we we would uh, lot them beds in 103 hospitals only where we had dialysis facilities and supposing mr chahal becomes covid positive and he doesn't have kidneys the moment i land up on a covid bed in this 103 hospitals i will just ring up my family doctor on the phone there are about 70 nephrologists who would have access to this 70 nephrologists who will have access to this portal they will just tell me to hold on the phone they'll open the portal they'll tell me how many machines are there in my hospital and which slots are available the moment they he the books a slot uh, as per uh, my desire the one moment they punch it i'll get a sms that my slot is booked for so and so hours and the technician there would just see my sms and he would take me to the dialysis machine at the appointed time so in this we even showed that more than 2000 people after that who became covid positive we can see on record that not even one passed away because his his dialysis could not be conducted this was very unique model which we designed way back last may and only Uh, to take care of this 10000 people now almost every day 15 to 20 such people were becoming covid positive 
Even more dangerous was suspected cases. Suppose Mr. Child doesn't have kidneys and he goes to Hinduja Hospital for, for his regular, regular uh, dialysis. And supposing I'm coughing, or I'm sneezing, they threw me away. They said, you are suspected. Bring a COVID a report. Only then we'll entertain you. Now, my COVID report may not come in 24 hours, 48 hours, and I may die if I don't. My dialysis is not done in in next 24 hours. So we created suspected dialysis centers in Ghatkopar and in Chembur on the portal. Supposing if I am shooed away, I'll just come back to my car, call my family doctor, would book me a slot in these suspected centers, and I'll drive straight there where doctors and technicians are waiting for me. And they'll, they'll, they will do my dialysis, sanitize the machine, and wait for the next patient to come. So it became a big blessing for suspected cases also. They were not devoid of, of uh, dialysis facilities. After that, we had uh, another big challenge. Those days, when I joined in the month of May 2020, a country like Germany was doing 50,000 tests a day. Mumbai was doing only 4,000 tests a day because we had very limited labs. Initially, to begin with, we had only two labs, Naidu in uh, Pune and Kusturba in Mumbai. Today, we have 56. We have a capacity of 100,000 tests a day. But those days, we had only 4,000. And people were getting, uh, getting unwell in large numbers. So how do, we, how do we make them survive? So the easy question answer would have been that we have facilities limited. What do I do? But we came with a brilliant idea. Our team came with a brilliant idea. By, by end End of May and first week of June, our jumbo centers with seven, seven jumbo centers, PKC, Nesco, Verli Dome, Mulun Naka, Daisar Naka, they became functional. And uh, we had almost 9,300 beds in seven jumbos, including 60% oxygen beds and 612 ICU beds. We reserved 2,000 beds, oxygenated beds in these seven jumbos and named them as suspected beds. And the deans, they were told that if any person who's feeling unwell, the first wave had hit the slums badly. The second wave hit the non-slums badly. In the first wave, if any, any, any of my slum dweller brother or sister, he would feel unwell, we, we, public, we threw a ward war rooms and electronic media, print media, we made a lot of uh, uh, publicity that if anybody feeling unwell and his swab is not taken or swab is taken, the report has not come, let him not wait. Let him take an auto rickshaw, let him walk down, let him take an ambulance. He should reach the nearest jumbo center because they were scattered from Mulan to Daiser to BKC to Verli Dome. We said, the moment you enter, the deans were told that they'll be put in oxygen beds. We would stabilize them, conduct their test. If found COVID positive, they'll move to the COVID bed. If found negative, they would be stabilized and sent back homes. So you'll be happy to know that 21,000 people till date, we saved their lives by this method of suspected beds. These 21,000 people who were found COVID positive later on, but they were stabilized first and test taken later on. This is, this is also a very really unique part of our Mumbai model. And to take out this 21,000 COVID positive cases with a positivity rate of 10%, we would have to do 200,000 tests then this 10% would have come COVID positive. We could save these thousands of lives by very simple method of creating suspected bed category in our jumbo hospitals. And to my knowledge, I don't have any information of any other city which has a system of suspected beds, oxygenated beds only in jumbo hospitals or in, in, uh, in their cities. This led to, this also led to nose diving of our mortality rate. After that, we, uh, uh, created a lot of other systems. Those days, we ensured that private hospitals must come on board. This we ensured within, within 10 days of my joining. On the 17th of May, 2020, a news item appeared in New York Times, which says that Mumbai's health infrastructure has collapsed and thousands of people are going to die on the roads. So immediately I summoned CEOs of 35 major hospitals, private hospitals in Mumbai. Hinduja, Lilawati, Nanawati, Fortis, Mulan, Bombay Hospital, Breach Kent, everybody. I, I, had a, I had a hard copy print out of that New York Times. I read up to them, CEOs. I said, look, you guys were trying to make Mumbai the South Asian hub for medical tourism. And I have myself seen uh, patients coming from Gulf countries, from African countries for the bypass surgery, for the angioplasty. 
and you are minting money and you're getting a lot of this medical tourism. But look what New York Times is saying today. If we don't do something, your reputation will go to dogs for next decades together, your credibility will be lost. So let us let us join hands. Let us let us ensure that our rep reputation remains intact. It, and it, we, we must protect our reputation. They said, so what do you want? I said, hand over all your ICUs to me, COVID ICU. Those days they had 412 COVID ICU in 35 hospitals. They had 6,000 COVID beds. I said, you hand over all these beds to me. You shall not allot any of these beds. You shall not allot any of the ICUs. And I will, I will be allotting these beds from BMC at government rate, 4,000 rupees per bed per day, maybe at Breach Candy or any other hospital. I said, you take a hit for a couple of months, maybe one or two years. But ultimately, if we, uh, one day, if we establish our credibility, you will literally become a, a South Asian hub for medical tourism. And your, with your credibility, people will believe you. And this is what has happened today. The, and I salute these private hospitals. They listened to me. They surrendered all their COVID 6,000 beds to me. They surrendered all the ICs to me at government rate. Just imagine we were treating patients today also in the morning also at 4,000 rupees per bed for a normal bed, 7,000 rupees for an oxygen bed, 9,000 rupees for a ventilator bed in, in 144 private hospitals in Mumbai. And because of this, suddenly my dashboard from 3,700 beds jumped to 10,000 beds within 10 days, which has gone to 30,000 beds now. The private hospitals, I salute them. They've done a tremendous job. They've taken, less, they, they've taken a hit of more than 1,000 crores. But today also they are serving with a smile. And they have, today also, it is BMC which, and the ward war rooms of BMC which are lotting all COVID beds in these hospitals. This was also a very unique public-private partnership which happened in Mumbai, which couldn't succeed in other cities where a very unique kind of model has come up, which is a window to the entire world. After that, uh, uh, our jumbos came to our, our uh, rescue. And uh, by end of May, first week of June, we had 9,000 beds in jumbos that took the dashboard from 10,000 to almost 19,000 by June, within, within, within 45 days of my joining. And then we had abundant number of uh, 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 beds. They had increased almost six times in, in just about 30 to 45 days. And the jum jumbo is also a very successful model. Uh, 7, 000, seven jumbos, 9,200 beds, 60% oxygenated beds, 612 ICU. And they were all greenfield hospitals. When I joined, they were being made as COVID care centers like it has happened in other parts of the city or the country. I immediately intervened within 48 hours of joining and I went to Honorable CM, sir. I said, sir, let us not make any COVID care center. We can always requisition thousands of rooms in hotels and put MBBS doctors there. They become COVID care centers. Let us have proper hospitals with dialysis beds, with ICU beds, with oxygen beds. And today, this is what we have in seven jumbos. And uh, they became the real hospitals. In fact, Nesco with 3,000 beds, 224 ICU, 70% oxygenated beds, dialysis beds is the world's biggest jumbo today, Greenfield Hospital, bigger than any other hospital in China also. So this jumbo has also became a very successful initiative under MCGM. This is one of our 27 uh, sub-models of Mumbai COVID-5 model. Then by, by the time last August, I found that this tremendous amount of uh, depression, psychological issues, which is coming into patients and their families, because once a person is COVID positive, he may not be in oxygen, he may not be in ICU. But the moment he lands up in a COVID bed, he's in isolation for 10 days, 15 days, three weeks, till he becomes COVID negative, he starts feeling unwell. His family is, is, is restless. They do not know the condition of the patient. So we, we, what we, do, we, we did a simple experiment, which is highly successful. I spent 1.5 crore rupees and we purchased 600 iPads and made all the seven. Jumbo's uh, facilities with uh, Wi-Fi centralized Wi-Fi facilities, and we told these patients who are on not on oxygen, not in ICU. We said you can talk to your relatives, your mother, sister, brother, husband, wife, daughter, son, an hour or two hours on on a video call from the from your bed to the patient's uh, uh, family, and the, and and every five patients ratio of one is to five patients, one iPad to five patients. We distribute iPads. And suddenly, 
this issue psychology issue should disappeared because a patient was so happy talking to his family and family was so happy talk, talking to his uh, the patient that they very reassured that patient is is fine and they can have have video calls and this this led to sudden disappearance of psychology psychological issues now the same ipads we did another experiment i went to the top hospitals in fact i must say that i have i have a outstanding relationship with private hospitals they are we are like a family so i told them look many of uh, especially in the second wave when it came many of the uh, middle class upper class people they have somehow a knack that they want to go to private hospital only they doesn't want uh, they don't trust public hospital hospital i don't i don't blame them also so i told uh, these major hospitals like for example breach candy and bombay hospital for dome leelawati and hinduja for bkc jumbo nanavati for nesco fortis for mulund i said you act as mentors and let our doctors have access to you so they gave me a list of 35 top doctors in these major hospitals and their cell numbers were exchanged with our deans and doctors in jumbos and the ward war room starting telling start telling the patients that if you go to bkc jumbo you will be entitled your doctors there have 24 hour her access to best doctors in hinduja and best doctors in leelawati you are under their safe uh, vigilance also this issue uh, this system of mentorship really reassured the patients and uh, we could start we started selling out our jumbos better to the patients who who are need of beds and today also these uh, 35 top doctors in these major hospitals they on honorary basis they're helping us on a weekend they actually visit these hospitals talk to the patients so this initiative or this sub model of mentorship has really worked out very well for us after that we made in mumbai we made at a point that we have to be two steps ahead of the virus for all the activities including medicines and throughout the first and second wave there was not a single day when bmc hospital lagged in any medicines whether remdesivir or tocilizumab or pavipivir we we would be the first one to grab it and i remember in the state task force meeting one of the uh, meetings chaired by honorable cm we had top doctors like dr duwadia dr sang joshi dr rahul pandey dr sanjay ok all present dr sang joshi mentioned he said cm sir in my entire lifetime i have never seen that bmc hospitals have medicines all the time 24 by 7 where many private hospital doesn't have he said this is the first time in his lifetime he found that like bmc hospitals are ahead of private hospitals in procurement of medicines and we there not a single day when didn't have the life life saving medicines available to us i took a great risk in the second wave when uh, i i procured 200000 vials of remdesivir you know just three, four days before then 1st of april 2021 our hafkin institute on gaur state government finalized a tender for 400 rupees per vial for remdesivir when my tender came on 5th of april after four days it was a 1558 rupees it is almost almost 350% higher the all my team told me sir there will be a serious order rejection because if you are buying 200000 vials is going to be a great loss to the exchequer and we may be under a lot of inquiries i rang up the md of the malan company in bangalore he said sir we can't reduce the prices we have limited stock if you don't give me work order in next two hours we won't give you anything in 5 minutes i wrote on the file i said the choice between saving human lives and spending extra money and and from my own phone whatsapp i sent him a work order and and throughout the second wave you we the only one body in the entire country where have we had 200000 vials with us 40000 at time available to us whereas in places like delhi a vial was being sold for 35000 rupees 35000 rupees and and next morning when i gave this work order on on the on the 5th of april the times of india carried front line allegations that major, major medical scam has happened in bmc 13 crore loss but i said i'll i'll stand up to any inquiry and i i, I because my conscious says that i've taken right decision and i was asked by media channels i said i had a choice i have to bite the bullet i, I had a, I, the only choice was to save human lives or spend extra money i chose to save human lives and later on the hafkin tender collapsed not even single vial could be supplied till today 
and my rate became the lowest in the country and later on a month after that in the first week of may the milan md rang me at 9 o'clock in the night he said mr chahel 12 states of india they simply copied your work order and issue gave us work orders they didn't issue tenders at the level at your rate chatisgarh madhya pradesh gujarat assam uh, uh, karnataka these states just copied our, our, our work order so you take very risky decisions to fight this battle out otherwise you can't uh, unless you risk appetite you can't face this invisible enemy then we 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 went for number of other uh, uh, models one of the most successful model i would like to share with you by september 2020 the, the second first wave started coming down and immediately honorable cm sir whom i, I salute he also his his hands on honorable uh, his hands on cm and who has given me tremendous leverage tremendous liberty to take decisions and that is one of the main reasons we could succeed he has tremendous trust in us he has blind faith in us and we have not let him down so in 15 september to 15 november we started my family my response uh, responsibility iec campaign where 15000 health workers of bmc they visited 3 0.51 uh, 3.51 million families mumbai has bmc has 35 lakh families 3.5 million we went to the homes twice from 15 september to 15 november 99% coverage we went with the pamphlet which talked about do's and don'ts of covid the back side had the had the directory of 24 ward room numbers and we took their body temperature we took their uh, a uh, list of comorbidities we we took their oxygen levels 51000 people were taken out and put in hospitals who were found comorbid we, we we could save them also and at the same time when our teams were educating the families of of do's and don'ts of covid uh, and the covid appropriate behavior we warned them also we said now from 1st of november we'll start finding you if you are found in public domain without a mask we're going to find you 200 rupees and you will be happy to know that since that time till today 31 lakh citizens 3.1 million citizen mumbai have been fined 200 rupees each for not wearing mask in public domain we collected 62 crore rupees 200 rupees per and we gave them free mask also and requesting them not to come again without a mask in public domain this is another reason that in the second wave total the maximum number of cases in mumbai never went beyond 11000 where pune had 19000 cases one day and pune's population 20% of mumbai because this no mask no entry campaign and my family my responsibility campaign was a great success and it it created a certain kind of covid appropriate behavior it may not be satisfactory today i always say that people are carrying a mask on their chin or in the neck or in their pocket but today there's nobody in mumbai who comes out of the home without a mask and we are still on that we are trying our best to ensure covid appropriate behavior because i always say mask is better than vaccine once you are wearing a mask you you are at a great safety so you must wear a mask in public domain till we get rid of this problem uh, in the second wave another thing happened was our oxygen management for which honorable supreme court of india has lauded the efforts of of bmc the when the when the second wave the cases started coming up because the second uh, wave of mutant virus was highly infectious on the 14th of april we had 93000 active cases in mumbai including 21000 on hospital beds so uh, we took another very risky decision on the 17th of april at midnight 12:30 in the night i got a call from one of my ward war room he said sir six hospitals are running out of oxygen in next two hours and if we don't shift patients 168 of them 34 in the icu 168 in oxygen all are going to die in next two hours we took a very risky decision we mobilized 150 ambulances between 1 am and 3 am on the 17th night and i you'll be happy to know that we shifted all this 168 including people on ventilators to our jumbo hospitals we well, luckily we had 3000 beds available 800 icu uh, 800 uh, oxygen beds available we didn't have icu but we put them in oxygen beds 
we did this operation between 1 am and 5 am with tremendous success zero mortality not even one uh, patient passed away in this entire operation and this was a great success but we took a great risky decision because we i was told that people would die in this transit i said nothing doing do it and we succeeded similarly when the when the cyclone came on 17th of may there were 582 uh, patients in in jumbo hospitals i knew that jumbo hospitals are made up to for for a structural strength of 85 90 km wind speed and that day i took a very bold decision i said we have to shift them to our other hospitals because by that time the cases are coming down so that on 17th may the wind speed was 130 km per hour and the roof of bks jumbo flew away but all jumbo was lying empty again we had zero casualty because of cyclone uh, totke that day so unless you take very rapid quick decisions only then you get good dividends so this all really helped us and uh, after that we we did a lot of other other uh, uh, models now coming to vaccination mumbai also has been leading in vaccination drive you'll be happy that till yesterday evening we have done 86.2 lakh vaccinations mumbai has 90 lakh people who are 18 plus so we our target is 1.8 crore doses out of which we have covered 86 lakh doses till yesterday and uh, 67% people in mumbai eligible category they have at least one dose each now when I, when i say this one dose each this means 67% people are pretty safe even if the third wave comes they'll be they'll be better off they may go to hospital but the symptoms would not be so grave they may not end up in icu and mortality can be virtually ruled out 67% people are safe and we are adding 1% every day because we do 100000 uh, 100000 20 uh, 125000 every day and if uh, god gives us another 30 days more the second wave the third wave doesn't come by end of uh, august will be around uh, 93 94 lakh vaccination and by end of september we should be about 1.2 crore vaccination where we would have almost 80% of mumbai curs who will have at least one dose each on them and uh, with this we plan that by diwali by november we can easily achieve a target of 1.8 crore vaccinations with the present speed with no further increase in the speed and the availability of vaccine so i am i am quite confident that by november end we should be uh, geared up fully uh, full full vaccination of eligible uh, category of our eminent citizens now talking about little about third wave in the third wave we got this uh, uh, warning from state task forces of eminent doctors and from first week of may honorable cm chaired a meeting and uh, cautioned us and uh, we got into action we have created four new jumbos now one malad two 165 beds with 250 icus and created uh, pediatric uh, cubicles the another jumbo hospital in sain one in kanjur mark is getting ready by 31st of august worli c phase jumbo is getting ready so by 15th of september we would have uh, 11 jumbos instead of seven fully ready and uh, 15600 beds instead of 9200 beds in the jumbos so we this is how we have carried ourselves to almost 30000 hospital beds now which we call as dchc dedicated covid health centers and uh, then we have created 1000 cubicles in this four new jumbos supposing the pediatric wave comes and a one year child becomes symptomatic positive now he cannot go to hospital alone the mother has to accompany the child and we have must provide privacy so we have created 1000 cubicles for providing privacy to the mother and child in this pediatric jumbo the four new ones which have come up and uh, we have now a separate task force advising us on uh, there's a pediatric task force we have already uh, put in place patient treatment protocol for pediatric home quarantined and hospitalized we had zoom meetings with hundreds of pediatric doctors in mumbai every saturday sunday at ward war rooms we call general practitioners family doctors and we train them and groom them for handling the pediatric wave so we are quite confident honorable cm always says that we hope for the best and plan for the worst and i'll be failing in my duty if i don't mention that what a what a leverage what a support 
what the independence honorable cm honorable uddhav balan thakri has given me in fact the day i joined and i reported back to him sir i've taken over at about 7:15 pm in the evening on 8th of may he said jai look if you succeed success will be yours if you fail failure is going to mine he said because if i if you fail everybody will say that i have changed general in the middle of the war and uh, this was wrong decision and that led to this entire problem but if you succeed everybody will say that you have succeeded you that one statement of my honorable cm put fire in my belly and it hit my soul i said come what may i have to succeed because look at this honor of uh, this man he's a real gentleman that has put so much of faith and trust in me by bringing me into this and i i could not never let him down so he gave me tremendous amount of flexibility tremendous amount of leverage with power to take any decision that this has really helped us in uh, tiding over these first and second waves and uh, there are a lot of other things which i would like to spend but uh, since i think we are limited time i would now leave uh, the house to op op open to questions thank you very much i now request shri paramjit singh ji to please uh, moderate if there are questions yeah we have uh, because limited time will take some limited questions uh, so the obviously the most obvious question is about the third wave uh, people are asking how severe do you see and uh, do you think that we'll be able to manage as we have managed the first and second wave yeah you know uh, like they just uh, submitted that uh, 67% of our eligible citizens 18 plus in mumbai have at least one dose each and world over it has it has been seen that once you take both the doses even if you have a lot of people like uk and us usa coming positives but there is not much pressure in the hospitals and even even a single dose also has virtually ruled out mortality so this 67% 1% people we are inching towards uh, 70% by end of this month and maybe 85% by the end of next month at the same time we have almost not 25% people who are double vaccinated so this uh, coupled with the herd immunity which got created because of two sphere waves in mumbai this uh, we have herd immunity of almost 45% in mumbai today with as per the latest zero survey conducted so this 45% herd immunity coupled with this almost 70% people who are single vaccinated this is going to dent the third wave even if it comes but i am really worried for the rural part of the country because if you remember between march 20 and december 20 when the first wave hit the metros in the bigger cities of india there was hardly any cases coming from 400000 rural villages of the country or small towns and the second wave which came uh, in in february 2021 was a de facto first wave in the rural india and now the rural india has to brace up for the second wave this sec third wave is going to be the second wave this is one one logic and second logic is the vaccination in in uh, rural india has not been very encouraging as compared to city like mumbai there are almost 40 crore people in rural india who don't even have taken even a single vaccine also so so these two factors put together really makes me worried that third wave can again be quite scary for the rural part of the country and sir um, what was the what was your experience with the civil society groups like the ngos like we have been doing work what has been your experience with them during the pandemic outstanding no, i'll give you reasons for that number 1 between uh, 24th march and 14th may when we were supplying 900000 food packets and later on we we scaled down to 7 lakh in uh, july then 6 lakh in august and even october we had almost 200000 food packet distribution every day all this was coming from ngos and uh, corporates and uh, civil society hardly we were uh, spending any money on that so i salute the civil society the ngos and the corporates for helping us in a big way those days with the uh, this kind of huge support then we had a problem last june it was i think 24th of june when we launched mission zero in seven wards which were reporting high number of cases 
एस एन टी वॉर्ड्स नेबरिंग थाने देन आर सेंट्रल आर नॉर्थ आर साउथ बॉर्डरिंग मीरा भाईंदर एंड देन पी नॉर्थ के वेस्ट सो लॉर्ड ऑफ एन जी ओ स्कीम फॉरवर्ड लाइक भारतीय जैन संगठना बिल एंड मिलिंडा गेट्स फाउंडेशन दे चिप्ड एन विद फोर्टी एट मोबाइल डिस्पेंसरीज दे वर फैंड आउट इन इन टू दी इस्लाम एरिया कंटेनमेंट जोन दे ब्रॉड देयर ओन हंड्रेड ऑफ डॉक्टर्स एंड दिस दिस इज हाउ दीज एन जी ओज हेल्प डस in in place like dharavi also uh, there were dozens of ngos who were working with us and today also wherever there is a hesitancy of vaccination it is the ngos who are coming to our rescue and they are uh, showing us the way so in all these efforts i must say ngos in mumbai have done a great job thank you sir one last question will take this positive time now that you have built this great rapport with the private hospitals sir can we think of you know developing a permanent model where these hospitals can mentor the municipal hospitals and the healthcare sector you know i i i forgot to mention you that the last four jumbos which is coming up in malad in sain in kanjurmarg and in uh, in varli race course area we tried a new experiment first experiment i tried was last year in september when we had uh, 612 icus ready in seven jumbos but we didn't have specialist doctors to run them so i issued a expression of interest and invited a group of doctors to join hands and run these icus so since last september till this august last 11 months all 612 icus in in uh, jumbo hospitals are run by privately by this group of uh, professional doctors i said we will give you everything right from medicines to equipment everything is our job you just bring in the manpower as per the medical council of india norms um, what is the ratio of ward boy or doctor or specialist or critical care doctor to a bed you uh, come uh, with that just this with that package we'll pay you 7000 rupees per bed per day i see a bed with 50% minimum guarantee so that experiment went work very well suddenly the the scarcity of specialist vanished and they they chipped in that was another one initiative we took in the 27 initiatives the this year we decided that lock stock and barrel we will outsource these new jumbos and let the let the private hospital run them so that people feel reassured that they they are they are an extension of beach candy or their extension of bombay hospital and we got nine bids from uh, private uh, enterprises and you will be happy that we issued work orders in all these four jumbos whether they are normal covid beds whether they are pediatric beds whether they are icus whether dialysis beds 100% outsourced to private uh, enterprises to run these jumbos B- bmc will just provide catering hospitality the equipment and we'll keep the hospital in shape medicines will provide and uh, as far as operations are concerned they have been totally outsourced so this is how we already got them in thank you sir i hope this continues in the future also and the maybe the mumbaikers will have a better better facilities for everything thank you sir uh, over to you farin now thank you sir this was amazing dynamism that we saw thank you razor sharp accuracy that we have seen and i would like to say a big thank you to our honorable cm for choosing and putting us mumbaikers in such safe hands god bless you all god bless the entire bmc team and god bless our cm and the entire team who's taking care of our safety 24 hours we come to the second part of today's program that is the nv memorial awards awards are important to us as they help us recognize and honor individuals who are unique contributors in the in this in their own field for this i request chairman emeritus pcgt our very own julia rivero sir to introduce and enlighten us regarding the thought behind the narayan varma memorial award we look forward to hearing you sir i th- i first greet to mr uh, ikbal singh Ch- chahal he was very kind to accept my uh, you know invitation to speak on this occasion we really enjoyed his his talk and it really enlightened us because there are many things i knew he had done but there are other things that i did not know now i know everything that he had really achieved here and we in mumbai have to thank him for keeping us comparatively safe 
as compared to other parts of India or even to our own rural areas or other big cities of Mumbai, of uh, Maharashtra. And also I want to greet my good friend uh, uh, Ursula and because I think she must be here. Yes, Ursula, I haven't met her for long because being of a certain age, we are both isolated, everybody is isolated. So we keep uh, uh, our own distance. So Ursula, uh, thank you for being here. And, and thank you for giving us Narayan Bhai, who was such a, uh, such a figure that it really motivated us. As soon as he became uh, a trustee of our uh, PCGT, you know, he changed so many things. I mean, he could make out his stamp. Like today, the, our new chairman is Mr. V.P. Raja, formerly from the, uh, was also a bureaucrat. Uh, he was an IAS officer, very well known, and who has uh, uh, also done a lot of uh, work on, on the students with whom we interact. So please note that I'm only emeritus now, <laughs> and it's only because I, I could get you um, it, you know, uh, knowledge about Mr. Varma that I thought that I should uh, sit in for him in this particular occasion because Mr. Raja did Hello. not really know much about uh, Narayan Bhai. Narayan Bhai was a very uh, unique type of person. He was a very, I remember that when we wanted to have our meeting and he was ill, we actually went to his house and had the meeting because we felt that without him, we could not really achieve whatever we wanted to achieve. He was, and the three, three institutions that have got together had only this in common that Narayan Bhai was our uh, trustee and that he uh, also endowed our, uh, our uh, after his death in his will, he left some money for us. So we decided we, it was our, our commitment to commemorate his memory. And we have this lecture as well as these awards. The awards are given, each one of us gives our, chooses our own awardee according to the work that we are doing. The PCGT, for instance, is more involved in the, uh, in the uh, use of the RTI. And uh, we, and we work with students to motivate them to be better citizens of this country and to inculcate in them some values, which I think is most important for our future leaders who will have those values. So uh, we have chosen our own um, body as DBM has chosen theirs and uh, uh, our BCS has chosen theirs. So I think, uh, Farin, you go ahead and ask the BCS, whom are you asking? DBM, sorry, first, to introduce their awardee. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us today. May God always keep you with us and bless you with good health and a long life. God bless you. The first award will be presented by the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society, known to us as BCAS. The Bombay Chartered Accountant Society is the largest and the most respectable independent voluntary body of chartered accountants in India with more than 9,000 members. BCAS is a principle-centered and learning-oriented organization to promote quality service and excellence in the profession of chartered accountancy and is proactive to change. The Bombay Chartered Accountant Foundation was formed with the principal agenda to apply its income and the corpus to various public charitable purposes, such as relief to poor, education, medical relief, rural development, and other objects of general public utility. BCS also conducts free clinics, including accounts and audit clinic, charitable trust clinic, and RTI clinic to help the members and non-members in respective areas. Eminent experts provide free advice at these clinics. 
We have with us today, Mr. Abhay Mehta, the president of BCAS for the year 1920-21. He is a partner in Mehta Choksi and Shah LLP. He is the member of the Financial Reporting Review Group. He is the resource person of the Expert Advisory Committee of the ICAI and the author for BCS publication, FAQs on Accounting Standards and FAQs on Standards on Auditing. I now request President BCS, Mr. Abhay Mehta to introduce the first awardee for the day, Mr. Maharshi Dave from Sparsh Foundation. Respected speaker for the sixth late Sri Narayan Verma Memorial Lecture Meeting, the BMC Commissioner, Mr. Iqbal Singh Chahal, trustees of the three hosting associations, other dignitaries and participants. A very good evening to all virtually assembled participants at this sixth Narayan Verma Memorial Lecture, followed by award ceremony for honoring philanthropic efforts of three mortal amongst us, but who are putting in super normal efforts for uplifting and assisting the less privileged ones. I am deeply honored to introduce one such personality. It is Advocate Maharshi Dave, who has been nominated as an awardee by BCA Foundation for his zeal, dedication, and focused approach in carrying out philanthropy. Advocate Maharshi Dave, lawyer of by profession, has his own law firm and specializes in real estate transactions. Philanthropy is in his genes of, uh, since three generations of their family is into it. His grandfather has, had founded Mano Mandir Trust. He and his wife, Miss Rutu, formed a trust spurs for the welfare of stray dogs. However, its principle of Jivdaya and helping those who help others made them to make up welfare activities for animals as well as humans. He is a ground level worker and instills confidence in the donors that their donations are being spent at the right place and for the benefit of the needy. Advocate Maharshi enjoys being in tribal areas and his core focus for tribal outreach is education and nutrition. Sparsh has helped digitalize more than 70 government schools and has a project by the name Annapurna through which more than 500 children get their Sunday meals in 14 villages. Sparsh carries out animal and bird welfare activities on a day-to-day -day basis. Sparsh was the first among during, during COVID times in Valsad, Palgar, and other places to donate oxygen concentration machines and cylinders. Advocate Maharshi's philosophy is that each day brings new opportunities to serve, and that for him is the best motivation. It is BCA Foundation's honor that it is associated with such an enlightened and noble person. We are proud that he is awarded for his philanthropic activities and which will further spur him to take up such worthy causes in future. With this, I present Maharshi Dave. Yeah, we will be now presenting the award on the screen. Congratulations. We now, request, we now request Mr. Maharshi Dave to say a few words. Uh, good evening, and uh, it's an absolute privilege to be here. Uh, I, hearing Mr. Chahal, I am a Mumbai car and uh, run an NGO and understand the difficulties that every one of us has gone through in the last uh, few months, actually now years. Mr. Ribeiro, uh, as a lawyer at RTI, we, we have been hearing about him and being inspired by him day in and day out. Uh, this is a big occasion for me because personally and also for Sparge, we are a very small NGO. Uh, we, we, we kind of keep it simple, we keep it small, and we, we want people to believe that their rupee is being well spent. In, uh, Sparge is now 10 years old. Uh, and the, the real joy is when a donor feels happy and the beneficiary also feels the same happiness and you act as a medium. So we believe in the concept of service. We believe in the concept of empathy. We believe in the concept that 
by giving you only get and the more you give the easier it becomes for you and it becomes much more kind of uh, you you start appreciating what you have uh it's 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 just amazing uh, being an advocate uh, i i always joke with my friends that it's also guilt cleansing uh, i'm in a profession which and i work for builders so uh, there there is a kind of a thing we generally joke around but uh bcas has been a very big support uh, i've been guided by i met mr varma personally because he used to be uh, the advisor for one of the group companies that i am working as an advocate for and he had that personality which would inspire just being around him you will feel inspired so i i thank all of you and uh, like mr mehta said it's a great platform for sparsh because it gives us an opportunity to do more to kind of do our best and to try and reach out to more people like mr chahal said we work in the rural and tribal areas and uh, my understanding is that a rupee in bombay is worth to the further you go away from bombay because it it kind of generates that much more value not that bombay doesn't need it but bombay is bombay has a very big heart in a sense i think most of the ngos here will agree that uh, most of the philanthropy is this is the gangotri you know bombay is where the heart is uh, we all run around everywhere but come here for resources so uh, i really think the uh, bcas uh, its committee its trustees and everybody here and i'll keep it short because i, I would rather like to listen to the other awardees too who i am sure must have done much much more and i will feel inspired listening to them and be motivated to do more thank you so much on behalf of the entire team of sparsh the trustees and all of you thank you thank you mr dave uh, hearing you reminded me of a quotation all of us cannot help everyone but everyone can help someone so thank you for being that someone for someone thank you The second award will be presented by DBM India. DBM India is a not-for-profit humanitarian organization working relentlessly for the last 13 years to create lasting change in the lives of children, families, and communities living in adverse circumstances. The NGO works with a three-E approach of education, empowerment, and employment. It works by providing scholarships, education support. infrastructure in slum schools skill training to youth and women at the training centers in the community mainly in m ward dbm also provides library and study center facilities so that children can study to the highest level of education dbm believes that nation building initiatives and efforts must come from enlightened citizens of character and courage the organization with the methodology of begin with self begin small but begin today is focused on an overall improvement of the community mr paramjit singh irs is the president of dbm india for the last 13 years he is at present the commissioner of income tax mr singh with a vast administrative experience encompassing two decades has a passion for social work that incites humanity in all of us He lives by the philosophy he believes in: "Give till it hurts." I now call upon Mr. Paramjit Singh to introduce the awardee, Mr. Ravi Singh, the founder of Khalsa Aid International. Thank you. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Sri Ravi Singh, the founder and uh, the founder of Khalsa Aid International. Khalsa Aid International is a UK-based humanitarian relief charity. providing support around the world to victims of natural and man-made disasters such as floods earthquakes famine and war the charity was founded by shri ravi singh who was struck by the plight of the refugees in kosovo in 1999 ravi saw the footage of kosovan refugees in the news and was inspired by the sikhi ideology which is sarbat da bhala meaning well being for all recognizing the humanity in all of us and reaching out to those in need regardless of race religion and borders ravi has taken the concept of langar's 
to the regions of the world that need it the most with the hope that it will help to rekindle people's trust in humanity be it flood in kashmir war in earthquake or an earthquake or an uh, war in iraq or an earthquake in nepal khalsa aid volunteers are among the first to reach there and offer aid they call him and khalsa aid the new red cross during the recent pandemic ravi and his team at khalsa aid has been at the forefront of providing covid relief by sending plain loads of oxygen cylinders oxygen concentrators to all parts of india including mumbai and in fact to other parts of the world also apart from distributing lakhs of ration kits and other relief material i'll before i call upon um, mr ravi singh to speak i'll we'd like to show a short movie and uh, which will showcase some of the work that ravi has been doing So in 1999, when we were celebrating 300 years of the Khalsa, and I read earlier in the day about a convoy going to the Kosovo-Albanian border, and I thought, why are we giving langar, which is a community kitchen for those who are struggling in society, to those who don't really need it anymore? And then I remember tying the ropes on the truck, and I was thinking, thinking out Khalsa, Khalsa aid. How about Khalsa aid? We could have called it anything. to have this seva institution which we talk about seva self for service for this new generation so they can do seva real seva as it was needed so it was it was a transformation overnight transformation actually it was overnight transformation social media changed the way calsai was seen by the public because our work spoke for itself so when social media came along we could showcase our work in a way that this is who we are this is what we do and and the world responded Two thousand and ten Haiti disaster was a defining moment for Kalsai. Hired an office. We then started hiring staff. We started building a team instead of just being full-time volunteers. We've now grown since two thousand and ten, and we continue to grow. And that's all because the sons of the community who recognize our work, and we will continue to grow. If you look at the success of Kalsai, one side you got the donors who believe in the vision. The next is the committed, dedicated, passionate individuals who take the message forward. We are humanitarians. You know, no matter what we do, we are driven by humanity, and it's great to see, especially young volunteers who follow the same ideology. We don't differentiate. There is that message, a core message of compassion for humanity, hasn't it? Everyone from day one who supported Carl Say, been a volunteer with Carl Say, from trustees to volunteers to supporters to donors to well wishers. So without all of these guys, we wouldn't be where we are. It's been an amazing teamwork, and it's going to continue. I'm sure many more volunteers will join us. So thank you, thank you for your love and support for Carl Say. It is indeed our honor to present the award to Mr. Ravi Singh from Khalsa Aid International. The award will come on the screen. For some people, volunteering to help is giving, but for the likes of Mr. Ravi Singh, it is a way of living. With these words, sir, we request you to share your thoughts. Good evening to everyone. Thank you for this uh, very special moment. Uh, I'm so impressed by some of the amazing work being carried out. You know the the amazing Mr. Chahal, uh, the NGOs, uh, and I think it proves that uh, one thing which is uh, lacking in in our normal lives that why does it take a disaster to bring people together? We should be able to work together without any disasters. But unfortunately, it brings, uh, the disasters bring the best out of us and the worst out of us. But the best is that we all unite to help each other. 
and this should be throughout our lives. I'm so pleased and happy to have our volunteers in Mumbai. Um, I think uh, Arnji Singh Sahab, he knows us, Kalwan Singh leads Mumbai. And we got an amazing young man who leads all the India operations called Amarpreet Singh. He was very young when he joined us, the early 20s, and he's taken on so many operations. So every volunteer around the world in India, especially during this COVID crisis in India, the volunteers were amazing. Every organization, not just Khalsa A. And that makes me happy that there is humanity. Sometimes we give up hope thinking, oh my goodness, you know, how do we do this? But like Mr. Charles said, that civil society, NGO, they all came together to provide food, provide sport, provide oxygen. You know, as you know, Langer is associated with food, but then there was that oxygen Langer, which was labeled because the, the young Sikh uh, volunteers were giving Langer uh, uh, oxygen and Langer. It makes me happy. As humanitarians, we not only raise the plight of humanity, we also speak for those who cannot speak. So when we see something wrong, as NGOs, we're not here to please anyone at a higher level. We're here to serve humanity. So we must also speak up for social justice, for justice all around, for equality. And sometimes you may upset politicians, government, but you know, like I said, we're here for those who do not have a voice. And upsetting someone shouldn't be our problem. Not speaking up for those who are downtrodden is an injustice to every humanitarian. And I'm so happy, honestly, to see the amount of work that went into Mumbai, how Mr. Chahal coordinated, is absolutely wonderful. And DBM, what can I say about DBM? Amazing charity, helping those who are absolutely underprivileged. And we are so honored and humbled to work with by Paranjee Singh and likes of those on DBM uh, to try to make a difference, to try to say to him, carry on, you're doing wonderful work, we stand with you. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you to all the organizations today. Thank you to the organizers today, Mr. Burma's family, amazing, wonderful reception. And together, there is, there is nothing we can't achieve, achieve if we work together. And I think that's the key. I hope after this, we can unite later on, next few days over a Zoom meeting, and see how we can help each other. Thank you very much once again for the award. It, I dedicate this award to all the volunteers of our Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uniting and working together, what a beautiful message. If we could all come together, we could probably change the world. Do your little bit of good where you are. It's, the, it's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. So true. And these words, though so simple, carry such a beautiful message. The third award will be presented by the Public Concern for Governance Trust. The Public Concern for Governance Trust is a registered trust founded by three concerned citizens Mr. Julio Ribeiro, IPS, Dr. R.K. Anand, a pediatrician, and late Mr. B.G. Deshmukh, IAS retired and former cabinet secretary to the government of India. This organization was formed more than a decade ago. It mobilizes public opinion, increases public participation and activism towards promoting honesty, transparency, accountability in governance. PCGT works with a vision to strive for good governance contain corruption, uphold and inculcate values, and enhance sadbhavna in the citizens. PCGT is managed by trustees with an impeccable record for honesty and integrity with a motto of public service. Mr. Julio Francis Ribeiro, Chairman Emeritus PCGT, joined the Indian Police Service in the year 1953 and rose to be the Commissioner of Police Mumbai from February 1982 to May 1985. Later, he served in quick succession as Director General, Central Reserve Police, Director General of Police Gujarat, Special Secretary to the Government of Indian, India's Home Ministry, Director General of Police Punjab, and finally 
as advisor to the governor of, of Punjab. He is the recipient of the Padma Bhushan in the year 1987. Post retirement, he was appointed as the ambassador to Romania. The then Prime Minister Sri Vajpayee asked him to go as governor of Jammu and Kashmir, but he declined because of his involvement in social work in his native city of Mumbai. I request you, sir, to introduce the PCG PCGT awardee, Mr. Ranga Rao. Right. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. I'll just read the citation we have. We have for Mr. Ranga Rao. It will give you the total uh, picture of the man. Mr. Ranga Rao retired as assistant director from the Intelligence Bureau in January 2010, after 19, after 39 years of service. With his desire to serve public causes, he started looking for work in any NGO, working, working on in that direction. The news of public concern for governance trust, PCGT, winning a PIL in the Bombay High Court against illegal constructions on the Palm Beach Road in Navi Bombay attracted him to the PCGT. I was then the chairman, so he approached me and offered to work in the trust by sparing all his time as he was a retired man then. He joined PCGT in July 2010. Initially, he was entrusted with complaints and grievances of those who approached us for remedial action. At that time, our late trustee, Mr. Narayan Varma, was toying with the idea of intensifying the use of the RTI Act. You know, Narayan Varma was a very close associate of Aruna Roy. And... Uh, he was in constant touch with her. In fact, he put me in touch with her also for this RTI, uh, use of the RTI, for the, for the redress and grievance of the public. He encouraged Mr. Rangarao to learn the techniques of using RTI Act from the great RTI activist and former Central Information Commissioner, Mr. Shailesh Gandhi. Soon, Mr. Rao started filing RTI applications before the public authorities to resolve the genuine complaints of poor citizens. The rate of success of RTI applications filed by the PCGT encouraged the trustees to design a program to spread awareness about the RTI among the student community of Mumbai. Mr. Rao, assigned by the trustees, visited many colleges, including the Government Law College in Mumbai, and conducted many sessions on the RTI Act. Thereafter, the PCGT started conducting in-house internship programs in RTI for the students. And since 2013, Mr. Rao has prepared more than 2,000 young students, mostly from the law faculties, for the use in, of the RTI Act to fight corruption. Students from other streams like arts and humanities, commerce, engineering, even medicine, I remember. We had a couple of students from the med medical stream also. And from all over, and also from all over India, because once we started working online, so we had from we accepted internships from people, from students from Jindal Law College and you know all these other colleges across India. They have also done internship programs in the RTI, and they have been mentored by Mr. Rao under the aegis of the PCGT. Many of the ex-interns now use the RTI to solve problems which come to their notice, and they keep in touch with Mr. Rao, informing them about what they have done. And he keeps a track with them. He has got a data bank and he, uh, of all these former interns. The trustees of PCGT, uh, led by their chairman, Mr. VP Raja, decided to honor Mr. Rangarao uh, with the Narayan Verma Award of 2021 for his dedicated service to the propagation and utilization of the Right to Information Act to further good governance. We are proud to present the award. 
to Mr. Ranga Rao. We will just see it on the screen. Congratulations. We now request our awardee, Mr. Rangarao, to share his thoughts. There is a line that reminds me of him. I've met him many times in PCGT office. Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. This is a man who walks the talk. We're looking forward to hearing you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Respected junior, sir. Chairman Emeritus. Respected Chairman Meepi Raja, sir. Mrs. Ursula Narayan Verma. And all other trustees of PCGT. All the distinguished guests and speakers on the dais, dear colleagues of PCGT, and my most dear past and present interns, campus ambassadors, aspiring interns, and students, I feel greatly honored to get this late Sri Narayan Verma Memorial Award for my humble work done through PCGT. Sri Verma, as I understood, is not only a visionary also a missioner to introduce, intensify, and spread the RTI word and work in PCGT to check corruption and open opaqueness rampant in the government procedures that have been troubling the common man always. Being foresighted and an accomplished chartered accountant, Sri Verma knew that for any mission to take off and achieve the desired results, Money is the sign for none. Though being frugal to himself, he was generous to others for any good cause and accordingly, he made available adequate financial resources to the PCGT out of his own hard-earned fortunes exclusively for the RTA work. Thanks to Sri Verma, Sri Verma's constructive and thoughtful initiatives for the cause of the RTA work and because of the continuous monitoring and guidance by the eminent trustees, the PCGT could bring about a smile and a cheer on the faces of those that were deprived of their timely pensions and other legitimate dues from the government. Lastly, I humbly dedicate this award to the PCGT and its mission and vision to its hundreds of interns whose keenness and interest in good governance kept me propelling all these years. And lastly, my wife and family, who, even after my retirement long back, fully cooperated with me, without whose help I could not have been regular in my work in PCGT. I continue to cherish my association with PCGT. It's inspiring. It's inspiring past and present in trustees, colleagues, and above all, its interns. And this award, if anything but, doubles my resolve and commitment to the cause of the art work. With the kind permission of the chair, let me share a few words of a current intern who has messaged me today afternoon. Mr. Sarvesh Naik, a student of Happy Home for the Blind, early Mumbai. He writes, in my childhood, I wanted to become a soldier and guard my country. But due to my blindness, I was told I could not. From that day, I never had this thought again. But today, this forgotten dream seems to have come true. After learning the uses of the RTI Act, I feel I have become a soldier of the RTI to fight against the evil of corruption that is rampaging as an internal enemy, if not an external enemy. Thanking you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now come to the moment of appreciation of our own commissioner, Sri Iqbal Singh Chahal. On behalf of the three organizations and the presidents of the three organizations, we are proud to present an appreciation memento on the screen to Mr. Chen. Sir, we admire you for staying till the end of the meeting. Heartful thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so grateful to you.
Thank you, sir, for being with us. Thank uh, you. Today has been an effort by all of us present here to pay homage to our very own Narayan Bhai, who has left his footprints somewhere in our lives. His exemplary work in every area is remembered by all of us, and we hope that today and this year, this day every year, we will be able to pay him a fitting tribute. We thank you, Mr. Iqbal Shehir, for your valuable time once more, and we thank you for your relentless service to humanity and for being a savior to Mumbai. On behalf of all us Mumbaikers, thank you so much. We salute you. I now call Mr. Abhay Mehta, President B BCS, to propose the official vote of thanks. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm honored that I have the occasion to propose a very well-deserved vote of thanks. Before going ahead to uh, propose a vote of thanks to Mr. Iqbal Chahal. I will uh, like to acknowledge uh, the awardees that they have honored us by accepting the, on, the awards that we have bestowed on them. Mr. Ravi Singh, Advocate Maharshi Dave, and Mr. Ranga Rao, we are really very, uh, uh, we really appreciate your kindness to accept in all humility the awards bestowed on you all by all the three organizations. Uh, coming to Mr. Iqbal Chahal's speech, I can say just one thing that it was a spellbounding speech. Uh, he mentioned that he started his journey from 8th of May. So I just calculated that you have uh, completed 473 days, which are non-stop action-packed COVID fight. And I am really impressed by four sentences which you have uh, just mentioned and they, they are ringing in my ears and it will ring for many more years to come. One is, let us not be demoralized. We are all chosen by God to serve the humanity. Systems will fight and not individuals. Chase the virus with offensive. What way better to summarize the fight against COVID than these four sentences? Again, sir, you are great a model of great. You are a model of great learning and model to counter any form of crisis has been given by you today. Your splendid demonstration of use of technology, data crunching, and data analysis to counter pandemic is really an exemplary example for us to replicate in any professional uh, of, of professional life. You have also developed and taught us how to effectively leverage experience, knowledge, infrastructure, and technology to the best. You have also provided glimpses of how an effective general allocates resources under one's command for effective fight. And lastly, one thing is for sure, if we had not brought you as keynote speaker, we would have really been ignorant of such humongous efforts with great innovative ideas carried out under your able leadership. Thank you for gracing the occasion we, for, from all the three organizations. Thank you, sir. Farin, back to you. Yes. Yeah. And uh, on behalf of all the organizations, everybody who has worked in all the organizations, there are many people who have been the backbone of getting today's uh, program successful. A big thank you to Rashna from PCGT, to Javed from BCS, to Mr. Upendra from BCS, uh, and to everyone from DBM, everybody who has worked together to make today's program a great success. We thank you all, all the people who are here attending the program, who are here cheering the work that we are doing, supporting us, supporting NGOs, and all the work that is happening. A big, big thank you from me. God bless you all, and may we soon be COVID-free under the guidance of Chahel, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> thank you very, thank you very much. much. I request, I request Mr. Aver Mehta to please end the meeting. Yeah, so thank, thank you all for attending the meeting, and we will officially close this meeting. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fareen, for the excellent comparing. We thank you so much. We didn't get to thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, my pleasure.
Yeah, and I think we are on live streaming. No, um, it's it's uh, it's okay. It's, uh, recording has been stopped. But we can leave. Just give us a moment. Okay. Yeah.